Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. Today, I'm pleased to introduce my special guest, Roger Earl of Foghat. Roger is the drummer and a founding member of Foghat. The band formed in 1971 and has achieved eight gold records, one platinum, and one double platinum record. Their amazing hits include Slow Ride, Fool for the City, and Stone Blue. They just released Eight Days on the Road, a live album celebrating their 50th anniversary. Roger joins me today to discuss his amazing music journey, including Fog Hat's latest music. Online Coffee Break. Well, hello, Roger. Good morning. How are you, sir? Good. It's a beautiful morning. Oh, no, it's not. The sun's going down. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I heard something very interesting about you that I had no idea. I hear you like to fish. I fish, therefore I am. Exactly. I happen to be calling you from what's called the bass capital of the world. Really? So they call it down here. It's, called, it's Crescent City, Florida, but we call themselves the bass capital of the world. So you know, I just I, thought, I've well, been what kind of fishing? That's so cool. Yeah. Um, I, I do all sorts, all sorts of fishing. Um, uh, I, I'll fly fish. I fish for little fish, big fish. Sometimes I'll uh, wander up and down rivers. Uh, sometimes I'll just sit out in the boat and put a chunk of herring on and have a glass of wine and a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. Do you tie your own flies at all? Uh, I used to. Uh, okay. My fingers aren't quite as nimble as they used to be. And, I understand. <laughs> uh, and my eyesight is certainly not as good as it used to be. I am totally with you on that. Uh, just baiting the hook these days is, is getting rougher. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Picking up hooks. I, I stab myself with them. It's, ah! <laughs> yeah. Blood is another ingredient to attract more fish, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's, um, I think I started fishing when I was about six years old. My dad took me fishing. So uh, there we are. You know, I was going to say your, your dad influenced you a lot because I was going to go back now and just talk about how you got into music and I said it was your dad. I, I guess music ran, kind of ran the family. I understood he introduced you to some Jerry Lee Lewis with some great balls of fire and kind of got you fired up. Can you tell us how that happened? Um, I was at 11 or 12 and uh, I came home one lunchtime from school. I used to ride my bike home and my father used to work at uh, Aston Martins in Felton, but it's uh, near uh, London airport. And uh, he would bring, cars home aston martins this is in what the uh, late 50s early 60s and um late 50s actually and he uh, he would uh, road test them he would be a panel bit he'd fit the doors and the and the panels and he would take them out and road test them to see if there's any rattles and squeaks they all rattled back then um <laughs> so anyway one lunchtime he, he played the piano as well and he said to me you uh have a listen to this boy, son. He can really play the Joanna. That's, you know, a term for piano. Mm -hmm. And he put on Jerry Lee Lewis's, I, I think it might have been, I think it was Great Balls of Fire, but I remember the B-side yes. was Mean Woman Blues. Ah. And uh, Dad knew a good piano player when he heard one. And Jerry Lee came over, yeah, this is 1960 or 61. Wow. Uh, and he took me to see him in um, a theatre in southwest London. Ooh, and yes. My mother said, he was never the same after that. It addled his brain. <laughs> uh, my older brother, Colin, plays piano. Um, I can play a slow blues in the key of C, but that's about it. <laughs> what what, 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 what are you doing playing the drums themselves? Yeah, uh, Actually, Jerry Lee had his own drummer on that first tour. Okay. Uh, uh, now the drums took me. Um, I started playing drums around that time when I was twelve. Um, I said to my dad, "I said I, I, I'd work after school and I'd worked in a bakery um, Saturday mornings." <clears throat> I said to dad, "Dad, I want to get a motorbike," and he said, "Well, I'm not going to help you with that, son." And I said, "Well, you had one because I, he had pictures of him. He had a <laughs> motorbike and sidecar and stuff." 
Uh, so I said, well, I want to get a drum kit. He said, well, I know somebody who teaches drums. So uh, he introduced me to his, uh, what was his name? Chris Hayes. Actually, he was the same drum teacher that um, the drummer from the Kinks had. Wow. So, yeah. That's interesting. <clears throat> yeah, actually, he taught a number of uh, pretty famous drummers, I think. Um, he was a jazz drummer. He, he played with a number of American musicians that would come over to England. Uh, he played with Oscar Peterson, a whole bunch of really cool people. Really nice guy. And um, it's, I think taking music lessons stops you from getting into any bad habits with playing. But, you know, like when you, but, yeah. you, know, when I was 15, I figured I knew it all. Um, Most do. Uh, Most 15 year olds do. I understand when you're 15, that, and that's how you actually at that job. Is that how you saved up for your first set of drums? Uh, well, I worked, uh, like I said, Saturday mornings at a bakery when I was 12. And I'd work three nights a week after school, delivering uh, letter heading, note paper, and stuff. Uh, you know, we, we weren't rich in the family by any right. strip. Uh, that worked seven days a week. We had chickens in the backyard, uh, grew our own vegetables. Granddad uh, and my grandfather we would grow vegetables as well. After the war, everything was uh, there was rationing, so uh, it was. Uh, but it was fun, you know. I play in you know bombed out buildings. It was you can find all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool too. Because I mean, you weren't that much older when you uh, joined the band uh, Savoy Brown, playing some blues uh, rock at age of twenty. How that how that come? I love how you didn't get paid for a while too. Can you share that story? <laughs> Yeah. Um, actually, I uh, applied for the job, first of all, myself and the uh, I was in a band with two friends from school, uh, Dave and Ray uh, Dorset. And um, for some reason, we couldn't get much work. It was a time when people wanted to have horn sections or whatever. And then we were a three piece. Right. And so we tried it. I tried out for the job for uh, Savoy Brown. Uh, didn't get it the first time, but they called me back about. A month later, and I borrowed Dad's car. Uh, it, was in a, it was in a pub in southwest London, Battersea, I think, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took the drums there and got upstairs. And I, I played for like two, two and a half, nearly three hours with them. Then I started backing up the drums. And they said, where are you going? And I said, uh, I'm going to work. Got a day job. And they said, we've got a gig in Birmingham tonight. So... Uh, that was it. And uh, nice. after about, we were working like three, four times a week. So, you know, I'd be going to Newcastle or Birmingham or somewhere. And, you know, I'd be getting back at about six o'clock in the morning and have to go to work. <laughs> Look wow. like the cat dragged in. I was a commercial artist. Yeah. And, uh, after about two weeks, I hadn't been paid. We'd done about eight shows. So I went to see the manager, Harry. Um, he was with the same agency that my band was with, so I knew who he was. And I said, Harry, uh, you know, I haven't got paid yet. He was Welsh, not that that's a problem. So was Jerry D. Lewis, I think. No, his family was. But <laughs> he said, you haven't got paid yet, Boyle? Well, we'll see about that then. So obviously I didn't get paid. Uh, so about another couple of weeks went by. <clears throat> so done about 16 or 20 dates so far. And uh, I went up to see Harry. I said, you know, you know, I haven't got paid yet. He said, you haven't got paid yet, Boyle? Well, we'll see about that then. Uh, this went on for a couple of months. <laughs> Typical musician, you know, we pay yeah. for it anyway, right? Because we love right. to play. <laughs> Who needs food anyway? <laughs> uh, I said, Harry, you know, it's been uh, like about six weeks now. And you know, I've got a wife and kid to keep. And my day job is in jeopardy. He said, you haven't got paid yet, Boyle. We'll see about that then. Uh, I honestly don't think I got paid the previous six or seven weeks worth of money, but I didn't care. Uh, I love playing. It was great <laughs> to be in. I got paid after that, £12.50. I had to quit my day job because it was, they were really cool people. They understood where my passion lay. And um, they put up with me, and so I had to hand in my notice. Gave a month's notice, and uh, wow! After that, uh, I gave up. I was earning maybe 150 pounds a week or more. I do a bunch of freelance work for 12 pounds 50. So I took a huge cut in pay. Yeah, I was happy, and I was a professional musician. 
<laughs> See, and that's incredible because I was going to ask you, what, you know, when do you know? And it was just funny because, you, you know, you pursue your passion and, oh, I mean, you just hung in there because a lot of people wouldn't go six weeks without getting paid. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, right. Well, uh, it was a great band. Um, the players were all great. Um, Kim Simmons was a great guitar player. I was some David calls. <laughs> We had a couple of different bass players at the time until Tony Stevens arrived. Um, but Chris Jordan, the lead singer, was uh, the one who really uh, moved me as a, as a singer. He had an incredible voice um, and he was writing, you know, a lot of original songs, whereas most other English sort of blues bands were like copying. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, Chicago blues bands or right. whatever. Chris was writing you know, original material. And uh, Kim Simmons, of course, was a great guitar player. And uh, we got on great. And um, we started having a degree of success. And then we came to the States. That was interesting. Uh, that? So in England, they have this saying, taking coals to Newcastle. Newcastle is where they dig up coal. So coming to the States with a, as a blues band, it was sort of like... <laughs> okay. <home. laughs> um, actually... Uh, uh, these estates, America is the home of music, as far as I'm concerned. You know, jazz, blues, country and western, gospel. Uh, you know, this is where music was born. Uh, the rest of the world listened to it and took it and turned it into something else. But um, this is the home of music. And I always, uh, I always wanted to come here. In fact, I think when I was about <clears throat> eight or nine, I had this idea that I was going to run away and stow away on a boat. Now, my older brother, who was four years older than me, would go along with that for a while. And then uh, one day I said to Carl, I said, I'm going to run away, Carl. I'm going to, I'm going to get on a boat and go to America. He said, don't be stupid. Bang. <laughs> Typical <laughs> brother. <laughs> now, now, Roger, I, I can't believe it, but it's been 50 years. So, so right after that, you form Fog Hat. My gosh, 1971. Um, I did tell some of our listeners um, about about you coming on, and a lot of them wanted to know where the name Fog Hat come from. Would you mind just tell us a little bit about, about, that, about that? Hold on. Let me have some wine. I'll try and remember. Um, sure. Actually, Lonesome Dave uh, came up with the name. He, uh, he was playing a Scrabble game with his brother, John, when he was a teenager, I think, then probably 13 or 14. And... Uh, he uh, he made up the word foghat, and of course his brother said that's not a word. And you know, sibling rivalries, as it will be, um, yeah. it became a word. In fact, we didn't actually decide on the name for the band until we were actually going into London to look at the artwork for the first album. And what are we going to call ourselves? Hmm. Mm. <laughs> hmm. It seemed to work. And I think it worked really well. One song, of course, you know, um, Slow Ride. I, I thought something was really funny because uh, I think, what was it? Um, Guitar Hero, when that game came out and people got to play along. Um, I remember me and, you know, millions of other ah. people. We finally got to play along with you, which was okay. awesome. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, what are you doing? You don't want light? No, it's all right. It's fine. <laughs> I like it in the dark. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was that? So say that. I, I was going back to the Guitar Hero when they had Slow Ride that came out. Oh yeah, um, and we all got to play along. Did that like bring a new audience to you? Because I mean, it's just amazing. It was a great call to to feature your your guy's song in in Guitar yeah, Hero. I thought that was amazing. I remember, I remember that. Um, it was really cool. We'd have six, you know, seven, eight year old kids coming to our shows, like with their little plastic guitars. Um, yeah, I thought it was it was fantastic. In fact, <clears throat> uh, even to this day, we get we have uh, we get a lot of younger folks coming to see us. I guess we got it right in the first place. But yeah, that made a um, that made a big difference. Actually, it actually wasn't us playing on right. Guitar Hero, but I think right. they made a good facsimile. The guitar sounded pretty good. The drums weren't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> you would know, right? <laughs> uh, but. Um, no, it was terrific. In fact, I remember at the time there was another band that had their record on there and they they were upset and they wanted to sue Guitar Hero hmm. because they didn't want their record on there. And you can't pay for that kind of publicity. No. Like, That's awesome. Yep. Uh, 
you know, I mean, we've been in a number of films, a number of, uh, uh, you know, commercials and stuff. I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, get people get to hear our music, whatever way they hear it. In fact, last night I turned on the TV. We, we were going through the channels looking for uh, a movie. And uh, Dazed and Confused was just running the credits. And it had Slow Ride. And Slow Ride was played. I'd never seen the credits on this movie. <laughs> And it played slow ride throughout the whole credits of like nearly eight minutes of slow ride. <laughs> that is awesome. And what I love too, is you guys are still coming out with some, some great songs. You, you just released to celebrate your 50th anniversary new song, um, eight days on the road. Uh, awesome. 14 track live performance. Uh, it's got, you know, great songs. Of course it has slow ride. It's got stone blue, which I love full for the city. Of course, right. uh, even play that funky music, which I thought was really cool yeah. to have on there. Yeah. <laughs> and then road, road fever now speaking of you know road road fever is on there i, I know being on the road it's got to be such a mixed blessing you know what do you like most or least about being on the road so much um you know it's like hurry up and wait uh <laughs> I, that hour and a half that we do is um <clears throat> it's great uh the rest is like traveling sitting on planes sitting on trains <clears throat> sitting in cars um we get paid for traveling. We're typical musicians. We pay for free anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love it. In, in fact, um, Lonesome Dave, our original singer, uh, was the same. He and I, like, we're like, um, we just, being on the road and playing was like our life. But some, you know, some, some of the musicians that we played with over the years struggle with being out there. I, I love it, still do. Um, you know, I still get chills before you go out on stage, you know, and all of a sudden the lights go down, the, the music comes up. Um, wow. I get chills. Uh, and it's, I'm one of those fortunate few in this world, I guess, to earn a decent living uh, doing what I love doing. So, well, okay. it's because you follow your passion and you're so good at it. And what I hear, heard is that you may be also working on another blues rock studio album coming out maybe next year. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Um, we went down to uh, the COVID no nightmare, put a bit of a dent in everything. Sure. Um, yeah. I didn't know it was going to last as long as it did, but um, <clears throat> we, uh, I kept in touch with everybody. We, I call everybody like once a month or whatever. <laughs> But it was strange not seeing everybody for well over a year and a half. So <clears throat> when we did eventually get together a couple of months, three months ago, it was uh, it was good. We sat, we played the first day. Uh, we have a studio in Florida. We played for about four hours. You know, calluses weren't quite there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a show coming up uh, about ten days prior to that. So. We had to get our fingers and hands and feet and heads in shape. Um, yeah, it was um, after we did our first rehearsal, uh, maybe we sat around and had some libations and hung out and got to know each other again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everybody in the band, like, we're, like we hang out together. We're good friends. So we get on real well. Um, everybody's a real professional. Charlie Hune, our lead singer, is a uh, great, uh, great guitar player. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian Bassett, of course, our uh, lead and uh, side player, has played. Um, he mixes all our records and produces everything. So it's, uh, yeah, it's good. Life is good. I tell you, Roger, you're great. And I I'm just thinking out there, um, I know we're kind of running on out of time here, but one last question for you. Um, obviously, you, you inspire a lot of people. Uh, Foghat does, but you do too as a drummer. So what advice would you offer to any aspiring drummers out there? Get a day job. I uh, know. Um, uh, um, I, I, when I first started, I played with anybody and everybody. I would look in the local paper, the local music magazines, and I, and I wasn't very good when I first started. Um, and uh, just play with anybody and everybody uh, i've been fortunate i always played i think with really good players and i think that helped you know 
raise your game. I mean, if, if the, as far as I'm concerned, if the band doesn't have a, a, a really good drummer, they're not going to be a good band. I mean, yeah. you, know, you can get by with a few other things and some, but uh, just um, follow your passion. Work, play with anybody and everybody. Um, practice, practice, practice. Uh, that can, and that's another thing. It, I mean, it's okay practicing and like, you know, getting your jobs together and stuff. But um, I, I personally love playing in the band, a band, any band. Um, you know, that's the fun part, playing with other people. You know, drum, I mean, you know, uh, I knew a long time ago I was never going to uh, approach the levels of people like Buddy Rich. Um, I have a picture of him over there. Oh. Uh, but um, it's uh, make, playing music is... Uh, you know, it's a passion, and uh, I still get a thrill out of it. It's it's fun, and making new music is, uh, you know, it's not like before when we make a ton of money or had done. You know, <laughs> but it's uh, being creative is, um, you know, I like to keep our creative juices going. That's why we have a studio, and it's not like it used to be years ago. Like we had a studio up here in New York. I mean, we had a knee board and, and second hand, it was like three quarters of a million dollars. I mean, you can put a studio together as long as you have some bright people with you, uh, you know, for three, four, five, ten thousand dollars. So, you know, just the microphones are expensive, but yes, follow, follow your passions and play with anybody and everybody. And I mean, keeping a band together is not easy. <laughs> you know, you get and you've done it for 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> four or five um, very strong personalities. You have to sort of, uh, it's, uh, it's a learning experience. And I love what I do. I'm real fortunate. Well, Roger, it definitely shows. I just want to thank you again for, for joining me today. Loving the new release of Eight Days on the Road. I want to encourage all our listeners to go download it now. Roger, <laughs> thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Online Coffee Break. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Roger today, and I'm loving the new live album, Eight Days on the Road. Highly encourage you to download that today. It's an amazing compilation of their great songs. Anyway, I want to thank Roger for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about them, just go to their website at foghat.com. I'd like to thank you for visiting us and listening to this episode as well. We really do appreciate it. Again, if you could share this episode with a friend, we would appreciate that too. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless.